Hey everybody, it's Anna and welcome back to my booktube channel. Today is going to be a tag video, but it is going to be something a little different from the tags that I normally do because I'm going to be doing the University Press book tag. This tag was created by Biblio Atlas, which is a channel that was new to me, but I found out about it because I saw Fariba from the Medieval Reader do the University Press tag. I really love her channel. I will go ahead and link both of them down below if you're interested in following them and seeing some like really quality booktube videos that I really enjoy. I didn't think I was gonna have the easiest time coming up with books to do for this tag because when I left graduate school also coincided with when I moved across the country and I had to get rid of a lot of books that I owned. So most of the books that I kept were not the books that I had used for the graduate program that I wasn't going to be in anymore. So I sold a lot of them, I gave away a fair amount of them to, um, you know, fellow students in the program that at that point really needed them more than I needed to haul them across the country. So I was a little worried that I wouldn't actually have books on my shelves to uh, share with you all, but fear not, I actually have 19 books to share with you in this tag. Three of them I have not read yet, and the rest I have read in some cases multiple times. And because this is a university press tag, I had to stick within the parameters of something published by a university press, or if I had a like Penguin Classics edition of a book, that still counts according to the original tag because Penguin uh, republishes translations that are put out by university presses. And I have a couple little extra bonus books tacked on as well because I really wanted to um, plug some awesome Norton Critical Editions even though Norton is its own thing and not affiliated with the university. So I want to go ahead and let's talk about some of the books that I haven't gotten to yet. First up is The Art of Courtly Love by Andreas Capellanis. This is published by Columbia University Press, and this is the like codification of the rules of courtly love of Queen Eleanor's court at Poitiers, and this is a book that I have been really interested in reading because I really like reading about the Middle Ages and I wanted to read primary texts. So I picked this one up secondhand. I also got this secondhand, and it is called Magic in the Middle Ages by Richard Keek. Keek Chiffer, Keek Chiffer, I couldn't pronounce the last name in the previous video that I hauled this in, and yeah, I'm sorry about that. And this is published by Cambridge University Press, and this is about how magic was practiced in medieval times and how it interacted with religion and other societal factors. Again, being somebody that studied a lot of the like historical documents and uh, court cases from things like the Salem Witch Trials and other witch trials in early American history and literature, this was something where we actually get a lot of the like early precursors to the novel from is these like confessions that were written by prisoners before they were about to be executed for witchcraft or heresy or something like that. So that's a lot of where we get the concept of reading, you know, the story of someone's life that would turn into these fictional lives that became early novels and stuff like that. So I'm very excited to read this. And then this next book I did actually purchase new. It was an expensive purchase, but I really wanted it because one of the, um, uh, editors is one of my old professors from my university, and that is Queer as Camp, Essays on Summer Style and Sexuality, edited by Kenneth B. Kidd and Derrett Mason, and this is put out by Fordham University Press, and this is about campiness, queer identity, and summer camp being a sort of foundational um, experience for many queer people and how that's interacted with queer culture. So this is an essay collection that I am looking forward to reading. Again, it was kind of expensive. I think this book cost me $30, but I really, really wanted it. So in my opinion, it was worth it, but I understand that that is not, you know, the most accessible price point for the majority of people. So the next, uh, like, slew of books that I have here are actually books that most most of these I feel like I picked up secondhand or I like inherited them from other people that were giving them away and 
yeah, I guess we can go ahead and get into those. Uh, I have only one Jane Austen novel, apparently, that's published by University Press, and it is Catherine and Other Writings. This is a collection of her juvenilia and her unfinished novels that I had to get for my um, senior year seminar on Jane Austen. I wrote my senior thesis on Jane Austen and, like, modern adaptations on YouTube, like the Lizzie Bennet Diaries and, you know, just other modern adaptations, uh in the internet age and we read a lot of her we read everything that Jane Austen wrote in that class we read all of her novels we read all of the juvenilia we read all of the unfinished everything and Catherine is really interesting because it was her first uh novel that she really like wrote to completion when she was a teenager and it's just about this you know young girl and her travails of being in love and it's interesting because most people, when they've read Jane Austen, they've read the, like, main six novels that she's best known for, but her older writings actually read a lot more similar to, like, the 18th century novels that I really love, and it's interesting to be able to see her progression as somebody that straddled to, like, very distinct, looking back, what is a distinct, like, periods in the history of the novel, and she actually wrote across those things. So in some ways I think you could kind of compare her to like say Beethoven who is considered both a classical composer and a romantic composer because he wrote in both styles across the time period where like musical tastes were shifting. So anyway yeah this is an Oxford World Classic which is published by Oxford University Press. I've got a couple other Oxford University Press books. Here we go. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, the, the cover says the translation is certainly the best we have ever had, so that's why I bought it. And in case you don't know The Canterbury Tales, it is a poem in Middle English. I believe I have a, yeah, I have a Modern English uh, translation. Middle English is still readable, but there is a lot of, like, difference in pronunciation between Middle and Modern English, and yeah, it can be very confusing to the modern reader. Um, but this is the story of a bunch of people that are going on a religious pilgrimage to Canterbury, which is a cathedral and holy site in the south of England. And they decide that as they are traveling along the road for protection and company, they're going to have a contest to see who can keep, who can tell the best story to keep them all entertained along the way and they have this one guy who is going to judge all of the people's stories and see which one is the best, and it's really a lot of fun. It is a great sort of example of a carnival of various different types of humans. It's funny, it's enjoyable, it's a great window into medieval life. Okay, I have... Do, 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 do. Oh, really? All of these next ones are going to be translated works, and then we'll get into my Nortons. So I have Graveyard Clay by Martin O'Caden, which in the Irish is Crane Keel, and it's translated by Liam McCon Eomer and Tim Robinson, and this is put out by Yale University Press. This is one of the first books that I, I have like a really old terrible webcam video where I reviewed this book, but it is basically a dark comedy that takes place in a graveyard because all of these sort of like bodies that are resting there have to welcome this new body that was recently interred in the graveyard and they're all just sort of lying in their graves and talking to each other and basically trying to deal with all of the things that they left unresolved in life and the fact that they feel like they're not getting enough attention from the people above the ground kind of thing like that and it is just a very strange book but a very enjoyable book nonetheless. I've never read something that was like so experimental in this way I guess. Like I know that I've read things like James Joyce and Virginia Woolf and modernist literature but this is really out there even by those standards. It is pretty short and this edition did come with some critical help which I think you should definitely read it with a critical essay because it can be kind of hard to follow if you don't, yeah, if you're not used to reading this kind of book and even if you are it can still be pretty hard to follow but I do remember really really enjoying that. Okay, I've got a couple in the Penguin Great Ideas series, which are just basically like special fun uh, issues of little books. The, these first two I actually bought when I studied abroad at Cambridge University, 
and that's Meditations by Marcus Aurelius and The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction by Walter Benjamin. This one's translated from Latin, and this short essay is translated from German. I really love Marcus Aurelius. He was my favorite of the Roman emperors when I had to study them for the classic side of my degree, and that Walter Benjamin essay is just something that was, like, really important to me in a lot of the essays that I wrote in undergrad, so I wanted my own copy. Then I got a secondhand copy of the Book of the Study of Ladies by Christine de Pizan. Um, I did make a few videos about the City of Ladies and its sequel, The Treasure of the City of Ladies, which I have here in a Penguin edition last year, and I really enjoyed these. These are kind of like proto-feminist works, and also Christine de Pizan is the first example we have, at least in the Western world, of a woman getting paid for her work of being a full-time author. She was a writer by appointment to the royal court in Pisa. And last Penguin Great Idea book I have is The Prince by Niccolò Machiavelli. Uh, probably people know him because of his last name, but really this is an interesting book about how to wield power and how to make it work for you. Um, I think that everybody should read this. I think it's one of those books that like people think they have an idea of what it's about, and then when they read it, they're like, oh, I had no idea that the book was actually about this. So I would definitely recommend this. This is an important book in like history and political philosophy. I think everybody should read this at least once. And my last Penguin book, oh wait, just kidding, my second to last Penguin book is The Metamorphosis and Other Stories by Franz Kafka, translated and with an introduction by Michael Hoffman. And this is a book that I had to get for a Kafka honors seminar that I took in undergrad. I got really lucky that this fancy Penguin edition was like on sale used and I bought it for super cheap. But yeah, this is just a collection of several of Kafka's short stories. Now for real is the final Penguin set that I have. And that is my little boxed set of the Fagel's translation of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. Being a double major in both classics and English means that I have read these books a lot. I have annotated them extensively, and I knew that I needed to basically just have my own um, reading copies of these. I don't even know how many times I've read these books or how many times I have had to go back to them for reference for my classes across both of the majors that I had. So this box set here was pretty invaluable, and at the time it was certainly the best student uh, translation that my money could buy, so there you go. And now I do have a couple of books that are Norton Critical Editions or published by Norton. Um, they, this isn't a university press per se, but I did want to shout them out a little bit because they do come with really good critical apparatus for reading classics especially. The first of those is this giant uh, murder weapon of a Shakespeare complete works that I've had since my honor seminar on Shakespeare and sexuality in college. Um, this is the Norton Shakespeare, which is based on a more complete multi-volume Oxford edition that probably, like, costs as much as a house, honestly, and it is edited by Greenblatt, Cohen Howard, and Mouse. I've read every single one of Shakespeare's plays, all of the sonnets, and all of the rest of his poetry at least once as part of this course. Most of them I have read multiple times, but yeah, this is the book that got me through that court. And it comes with all this really helpful stuff like Shakespeare genealogy, essays that preface all of the plays about putting them in their cultural context and stuff like that. And it comes with just a lot of critical work. It comes with scans of what the, you know, original published versions of Shakespeare's works looked like. I'm a massive Shakespeare nerd. I feel like I don't talk about that enough on this channel. Um, I guess because I don't know, It's it's been a while since I had like a group of theater people to geek out with about Shakespeare over, but yeah, I fucking love Shakespeare. Always will, I presume. And then I have another book uh, that was from my Jane Austen seminar, and that's the Norton Critical Edition of Mansfield Park. This is a pretty polarizing book among Jane Austen fans. People usually either love it or hate it. I think I'm one of the few people that's squarely in the middle on this book because there are things that I really love about it and then there are things that I absolutely despise. But what I don't despise is what a good job this book does of 
putting Mansfield Park within the context in which it was written. There's a lot of topical stuff in this book that you don't really understand as a modern reader unless you've spent your entire time studying like what the state of plays and dramatics were in the 18th century. I'm guessing since most of you watching this haven't done that, this book is a real lifesaver if you have not, you know, if you don't have a PhD in like what the theater was like in the late 1700s because it gives you all of the information that you need to understand the topical stuff that's going on in this book. So I would highly recommend that. And then my last two are more Shakespeare books. These are Will in the World and The Swerve, How the World Became Modern, both by Stephen Greenblatt. I guess this one is subtitled How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare. Stephen Greenblatt is like the greatest living Shakespeare scholar. If you've never heard that name before, chances are if you've read anything by Shakespeare, you've probably encountered at least an introduction or footnotes of some kind uh, by Stephen Greenblatt in the book. And these are books that I bought used at like library book sales and stuff like that. And Stephen Greenblatt was kind enough to actually autograph them for me. He came to visit Seattle a couple of years ago. Here's his little signature and he crossed out his own name. Um, he came to visit Seattle University a couple years ago and I was living really close to there at the time. So my husband and I went to go hear him give a talk about his new book about Adam and Eve. I'm forgetting what the subtitle is for that, but basically it's how the Adam and Eve story has shaped modern history, modern literature, stuff like that. Um, if you are a Shakespeare fan or if you are like thinking of getting more into Shakespeare or you're just curious about Shakespeare in general, I would highly recommend Stephen Greenblatt's books. He is like a treasure of a public intellectual because he writes things that are clear and concise and easy to understand from a like layman's perspective but also if you have spent a lot of time studying Shakespeare or you know studying this type of literature you will still get a lot out of his books. He does academic writing the way that it should be done, absolutely. So those are the 19 books published by university presses or university press adjacent in the case of my Norton editions. I don't know, I think we can count the complete Shakespeare Norton edition as a university press edition because it is based off of the actual Oxford University Press edition. Um, I know that like <laughs> this is very different from the stuff that I normally post on my channel but you know just remember this was a pretty big part of my life for a long time like being in school and studying stuff like this and as you can see I am still picking up books published by university presses to read even though it's been years since I last was in a classroom. So they can actually be really great resources for learning things and going to secondhand bookstores particularly is a great way to pick up books published by university presses at a much more affordable price. Like I said, I think out of all of these 19 books, I have only ever paid full price for one of those. And again, it was because I really wanted it. So do you guys have any collections yourselves of university press books? If you do, please consider yourself tagged. I would love to see you showing off a bit of your collection. And I'm really interested in like this side of what people read on booktube. So tag me in it if you make a video. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and help me on my quest to 300 subscribers by the end of the year. That would be awesome. Thank you all as always so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.